Right, I hope you guys can see this right now. Yeah, is this all right? Yeah. Okay, we'll be covering questions on science and tech. Yeah, and then we'll look at some examples on technology. After that, I will talk about the difference between science and technology, a very important... There's no sound? Okay, sure. Sorry, we're experiencing some technical glitch. I'm doing this for the first time after a long time, so <laughs> expecting some problems, technical issues. Can you guys hear us now? it out a little bit. Uh, okay, just, sure. Yeah, okay, sound works now. Yeah. The sound works, yeah. All right, fantastic. So do you guys hear anything that I've mentioned over the past five minutes? All right, as I was saying, we're going to be covering the different types of questions in science and tech, some examples on technology, and uh, we'll then go into science. But before that, we'll talk a little bit about the difference between science and technology, very important distinction you have to make before you answer science questions. And <clears throat> at the very end, we'll give you some very good tips on how to evaluate science and tech questions. It's very important, so make sure you stay to the end of the crash course, all right? Okay, now, uh, Mr. Chen is gonna start off the, um, the Mentimeter to talk about the, the types of science and tech questions you're gonna encounter. So, handing over to you, Mr. Chia. Yeah, give me a second. So the first thing we will talk about actually would be to look through this series of questions and what you guys need to do for us is to weigh the following statements from agree to disagree. So let us know what you think. We have three statements here. The first one is Sun Attack is the most common essay topic. The second one is we can revise for GP using examples. And the last one is that you're ready for more Sun Attack knowledge. Please join us on mandy.com. You can see the code there. Is four one zero nine five seven nine zero. Tedis. Okay, so we have nine answers so far. We'll wait a while more to see what you guys say. And then we will talk a bit about what the statements say as well. Okay, I'll just give it another 30 seconds or so. Maybe I'll let you guys log in if you have not been able to get onto Menti. And just to be in 10 seconds, I'll run through this first. Okay, let's talk about this. So the first question that we asked you guys was, is Sun and Tech is the most common essay topic? Do you guys agree or disagree in the first place? So most of you guys said yes, you do find that it's the most common topic. Uh, based on what we see in the national exams, it is the case that every year there will be about two science and tech topics or questions being asked but you have to be careful of course that the questions that you ask for science and tech could vary in terms of the types of things that you want to see in science and tech so don't forget when we talk about the general impact of science and tech there could be questions that ask you about things like ethics or regarding the pace of science and tech as well with regards to the other part then so you guys are kind of right in saying that it's one of the most common topics even in schools when they test you guys you will find that is the one that they tend to give you a couple of questions for, and that's why we're doing this for our first crash course together to help you guys out for your exams. The second question, you guys said, I can revise GP using examples. And again, most of you guys are saying you kind of strongly agree to this, uh, that by nobody has said fully that they agree. Most of you guys are leaning on the fence here. So one thing that's important about your GP paper is that you want to focus more on the arguments. And what we'll go through today, 
There will be different kind of arguments you can use to frame your science and tech questions. Then you have examples. You could probably use it uh, to then fit into different arguments. Don't forget, important thing is that you've got to lead your essays with arguments first and let the examples help strengthen your arguments instead of using example-driven arguments or example-driven points in the first place. Now, most of you guys are ready for our next part. So I'll pass the time back to KP as we go back into the lecture or the crash course itself. And let me just change the share screen as well. KP, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chia. Okay, so, uh, so we've covered this. Maybe the next one. Okay, some things to take note of. All the resources that you see over here will be listed in the comments below, so don't panic. Uh, we will be sending out the resources. Uh, I mean, if you can contact us, there'll be contact information later on at the end of the course. And uh, if you don't know where to find it, you can always refer to the comments below. Cool? All right, uh, next. All right, we're going to cover some questions for science and tech. Maybe Mr. Chia will share with you on this one right here. Okay, so actually you can find this list of questions if you scan the QR code, but if not, uh, when you scan the QR code anyway, you will get to see uh, the list of questions that appear for the different topics that we we're talking about just now. There are general questions about the impact of science and tech, but beyond that, there could be questions that will be based on specific aspects of technology and science in the first place, like artificial intelligence or medicine health and aging, or it could be about how it affects animal testing, animal research, or even other skills or other aspects of society as well. So you can use this as a handy list for you to revise and look through different questions that you want to plan for in your exam revision. There's also one other part to think about, especially when it comes into religion. We'll leave it up to you guys to read through this as well and how it affects other aspects of our lives as well. Okay, I'm going to move backwards. And so you can scan a QR code to get access to this. I'm just going to leave the QR code here for a minute so you can scan it, use your phone, take a picture, do anything you would like to. Uh, do pay attention uh, here, science and tech is one of the most common kind of questions you'll see, which is why every year we cover science and tech questions and we encourage all students to study for science and tech. One of the best things about science and tech questions is, I would call it somewhat evergreen, so it doesn't evolve as much or as quickly as questions in, say, politics. You know, politics changes very quickly. So um, if you are looking for something that you can use that's it's going to last you a little longer, I will highly recommend going for science and tech as a topic. Now, of course, there are other topics that we'll cover on uh, different GP subjects, the, uh, GP topics, and those will be important as well. If you are interested, you can always check out our YouTube videos or you can check out the resources that we're going to be sharing with you. Okay, next, let's go into the lecture proper on technology. Okay, so we're going to start off with technology. A lot of students, when you when you see the word technology, um, you may be reminded of things like you know, your smartphones, the internet, your computers, but that is not all there is to technology. There are a lot of things we can cover in technology. One of the key things about doing well for technology questions is to look at the different areas of technology. Now, what are some of these things here? Now, we can, talk of, <clears throat> we can think of technology in different ways, military technology, environmental technology, digital technology, like your phones and all that. Transport technology is something that I'm very interested in. Agriculture technology, this was tested, uh, I believe, in 2020 on uh, whether science is a solution to world hunger. And no medical technology. Now, these are all very important areas. Of course, there are other areas like sports, education, arts, politics, and business. Uh, I'll not go into too much details on these. Uh, I'll just touch on them later on. So the previous, six, the previous slides, you saw the six areas, right? Every time you see technology, Try to brainstorm uh, in those domains that you saw. All right, now let's go into the question for today. Okay, I don't have the question here, but I'll tell you verbally, so do pay attention. The question is, modern technology improves the quality of life. Modern technology improves the quality of life. Do you agree? Now, when you have a question like that, you need to look at the positive aspects of technology and the negative aspects. So let's look at the positive aspects of technology. Now, the first one is how technology extends possibilities. Extending possibilities in what way? You know? um, maybe I can just give you a quick uh, example. In the 1900, can you guess the average human lifespan in the 1900? Okay, I, I guess some of you might think like, 
40, 50, 60. Okay, right now the human lifespan, life expectancy is about 75 right now, globally. In Singapore, it's closer to 85. Now I can tell you in 1900, okay, any response? No, okay. Now I'll tell you a shocker. In the 1900, the average human lifespan was only 31 years old. And I'm past 31, by the way. <laughs> Okay, so whatever I'm leaving right now is just bonus. Now, one of the things that has uh, enabled um, this extended lifespan is technology, the use of antibiotics, the use of imaging, the use of like modern scientific um, medical approach. So all those things okay, about technology, they're extending what is humanly possible. It can be our lifespan. It can be what we are capable of doing in terms of um, communicating. It can be you know, all sorts of things. So the human body and mind have certain limitations, but technology can help us extend that. Uh, we can see this in communication technology. You can now talk to people across like halfway around the globe. You can have Zoom meetings with them, and you can even pray online. In the Vatican City, they have this app called Click to Pray. I find it quite interesting. So you can use any of these as examples on how technology extends the possibilities that we have. And what else do we have? Hey, transport technology. Now in the 1800s, it took about three months to cross the Atlantic Ocean. You know? So if you want to go from, say, New York to London, that's three months. And in these three months, a lot of things can happen. Okay? Think of storms, think of you know, piracy. Um, the risk of crossing the ocean in the past was really high and the chance of dying was really high. But today, the same journey takes us five hours by plane and just one week by ship. Now, this example is also very good if you want to talk about uh, topics like globalization. You can use this to start off your uh, globalization essay, for example. Okay. Next up, we have battery, lithium-ion batteries. You think of lithium-ion batteries, you think of like your smartphones, you think of your iPads, right? But to me, lithium-ion battery is a lot more than that. Uh, think about our electric cars. Electric cars are made possible because we have a very efficient storage of uh, power. In this case, it's lithium is lithium-ion batteries here. Uh, now, over the next couple of years, you'll see the lithium prices going up because we are using more and more electric cars. And the uh, one thing that you might want to note is that in 2019, the Nobel, Prize, the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry was actually won by the person who researched lithium-ion batteries. Okay, <clears throat> next up, medical technology. Like I say, people are living a lot longer today, 73, I think it's close to 70, 75 years old right now. Uh, when it was just 31 years old. Uh, there are other breakthroughs in technology that we also see. For example, uh, in imaging, we can now use AI to detect some uh, diseases through what? Through mammogram, to chest TT scan, MRI scan, colonography. Because the human eyes can only see so much, um, maybe there are things that doctors might miss out. We can use AI to supplement this uh, ability to diagnose. And one of the things that I recently encountered was I contracted um, COVID two weeks ago and I had to see doctors. But instead of seeing doctors like how I've usually done it, I actually called a telemedicine, a teleclinic, if, I think that's what they call it. So you just download an app and you can see a doctor online. They'll give you the medicine. They'll give you uh, advice on how to recover from the disease just through the phone. You don't have to go to the clinic physically. I think that's going to be the future for uh, medicine over the next couple of years. You'll see a lot of changes in this. All right. Okay. Now, this guy, his name is Eliud Kipchoge. He is from Kenya, I believe. He broke the record of marathon. Now, how long do you think it takes to run a marathon? It's 45, 42 kilometers. Now, most of my friends, I don't run a marathon, I don't know, but a lot of my friends will tell me they take about five hours, six hours. Maybe if they're strong, they can run it within like, you know, four hours. But even that is quite a feat already. But this guy, he actually ran a marathon in just under two hours. How did he do it? He did it with the help of technology and science. So he had carefully planned diet. He had um, paces, meaning people who would help him, um, who helped run with him so that uh, in order to reduce the wind resistance as he will face. He had a car that will help pace the pacers who will in turn pace him. And he had this, uh, very interestingly, these shoes from Nike. It's called Nike Vapor, Pl Vapor Fly 4%. These shoes can improve running efficiency by 4%. Now in sports, every percentage counts. Every tiny improvement in our performance can lead to huge results, huge um, uh, improvement in our results. So this is how technology has helped us break the human barrier. Okay, now, 
So here's a quick summary of how technology can extend possibilities right, through ICT, uh, in uh, medical technology, in transport, and in, sport, uh, in transport and in sports. So I'm going to leave this slide here and um, let's go on to the next part. Right. Technology improves our welfare. How do we do that? Right. Think about what we mentioned earlier, using AI to look at images to help us diagnose diseases. Uh, in the past, we had X-rays, right? But X-ray can only see a limited, um, can only diagnose a limited number of uh, diseases. There are a lot of diseases, a lot of conditions that can only be made, uh, that can only be accurately diagnosed with things like MRI, with things like CT scans. So these things have improved our chances of survival because doctors can more accurately make diagnosis. All right. Okay. Oh, that's interesting here. Do you know that if you have a heart failure, you can, um, or if you're waiting for a heart transplant, you can use this artificial device called LVAD, left ventricular assist device. Okay, put it on the heart. The doctor can install it on the heart while you're waiting for the heart transplant. Now, this technology was actually a spin-off from space technology. Those of you um, who might have looked through A-level questions, you might have seen that you know space technology was tested a couple of years back. So. Um, NASA was actually testing out engines for space and they found that this engine, the design of the engine could be used to pump blood in our heart as well. So maybe in the future, we, we don't even need heart transplant anymore. We can just use NASA technology. All right, now next up, for people who have diseases like cancer, um, very often one of the complications is taking a large dose of drugs. But that's not good for them because the drugs can harm their body. So doctors have been finding out, or researchers have been finding out ways to deliver medicine, drugs, to a specific site, specific tissue, to target just the cancer cell, rather than you know, just take drugs you know, that can affect the entire body. Uh, and scientists have found a way to use DNA and fold it into origami like this. You now what you see over here on the right, those are actually DNA. Now when we can manipulate the shape of DNA, we can also deliver medicine, drugs to specific sites to help us cure diseases. Now let's talk about military technology. A lot of people talk about military te technology, they think about like nuclear bombs, they think about very destructive technology. Now here's a tip for you, if you're going to talk about military technology and why it is good, think about defensive military technology. I'm going to repeat, defensive military technology. Now this system that we're going to talk about is called the Israeli Iron Dome. If you, if you have been following us on YouTube, I made a video about this. The Iron Dome is a system that intercepts incoming missiles. Uh, it is used by Israeli forces to uh, intercept the missiles from Palestine in order to prevent the missiles from hitting civilians on the ground. It has saved a lot of lives. Uh, I think this uh, missile system was widely used in the past couple of years when there was a conflict between Israel and Palestine. Very, very useful uh, technology to save lives. And a very similar technology is the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, THAAD. This was deployed by South Korea to detect incoming missiles from, guess where, from North Korea. Uh, this technology is very, very controversial because uh, China is not happy with this uh, installation of THAAD because they believe that the system is also, is also detecting what's happening within China territory. So uh, if you're talking about politics, you might want to bring this in as well. Okay, so a quick summary. Technology improves our welfare. Militarily, it improves our welfare when it comes to medicine. Okay, let's move on. Now, technology is a great leveler. When we use the word leveler, what we mean is everyone has an equal playing ground. So in, uh, in addition to uh, helping us improve our lives, right, it also makes sure that people who are less privileged have a chance to rise up the social ladder. Now, how does it do that? Think about transport system like this one. This car, uh, can't quite see it, is uh, it's a self-driving car designed by Waymo. Waymo is a company that's owned by Google. It has um, self-driving capability, as we know that, but I guess the people who can benefit the most from self-driving cars are the ones who are disabled, who can't move, because now they have a sense of mobility that they did not have in the past. Okay. On top of that, this is something that I'm very interested in, which is MOOC, we call it MOOC, Massive, open online courses. MOOCs are, are platforms where you can learn different courses from uh, universities. So uh, in the past when I was uni in university, I used Coursera to learn from, 
professors from because my professor wasn't very good by the way so I had to learn from other professors from MIT from Harvard so I use Coursera uh, nowadays people from developing countries they are seeing this as a huge opportunity for them to get education they don't have to go through formal education in order to gain the knowledge that ne that is necessary for them to succeed in the workforce to climb up the social ladder they can get a lot of these resources for free uh, because of MOOC okay so Technology is a great leveler. We talk about how technology can improve the lives of those who are disabled. We talk about how technology can improve the lives of those who are in developing countries. Okay. Next up, technology can solve humanity's problems. Right? Uh, when we design technology, very often we think of the problems that we're trying to solve. And then from there, the innovators, the scientists come up with solutions. Now, what are some of the things that we have solved with technology? Uh, think about precision agriculture. In the past, agriculture was done in a, in a massive scale. If I want to, say, uh, apply pesticide, i uh, apply across the entire field. If I want to water, uh, water the plants, I'll do so for the entire uh, plantation as well. But nowadays, that's not done anymore because with the use of 5G, IoT, Internet of Things, and AI, we can precisely uh, locate the plants the, or the particular area that requires, say, more water or more pesticide, and we just target that part of the farm. This will reduce the resources that are required. It will also improve the crop yield. Very, very effective. And um, this is a very new thing. I hope you can use this in your examples next time. And one of the things that you want to take note is this is what 5G is, in, is enabling because a lot of it is done through sensors, sensors to tell us the soil condition, the moisture content, the temperature, the crop yield at a particular location, um, whether the, uh, a particular location has um, pests or even uh, wheat that needs to be addressed. So that's how precision agriculture is going to be, you know, it's going to be a huge thing in the next couple of years. Okay, one of the things I really like about precision engineering, oh, right, sorry, precision agriculture is the use of biodegradable, biodegradable chipless sensors right here. Now, can you imagine sensors? Typically, you think of a sensor that's made of metal, plastic, but these sensors are made of biodegradable material. That means when they degrade, if we live in, uh, in the ground for an extended period of time, we don't have to worry about it leaching toxins into the environment. Hey, now, we talk about sensors. Now, what do sensors do? Sensors are great at collecting the information, but the information is useless if we don't process it. So companies like uh, Fazel, I do, I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrongly, they are collecting all this data, processing it, and then sending it to apps where the farmers can use. These farmers can then use the, the, the data to decide what to do with a particular parcel of uh, their farm. For example, maybe a, a specific site of the farm requires a bit more pesticide, then they would administer the pesticide accordingly. Okay, so that's precision agriculture. Now, what about agriculture in, in other ways? Now, if you have watched Black Mirror, uh, which is a very fantastic series that I recommend you watch when you're free, uh, it's about technology, I love it because I'm a, I'm a technology fan. Uh, you can see this scene where they use um, drones, not drones, what are they? Bees, drone bees to pollinate flowers and plants. Now, this is actually being done in real life. We are using drones, actual drones about this size, to pollinate flowers in apple plantation in America. So um, that's how drones are being used already in agriculture. Um, now, that's uh, only one application of drones. You will see a lot of application of drones in, in imaging as well. What I talked about earlier, for precision agriculture, it also uses drones to figure out which parts of land uh, is maybe lacking certain nutrients based on the color, based on uh, the size of the crops, the crop yield, and they can uh, use this information to help them improve the crop yield. Okay, maybe next one. All right. So, Rwanda blood supply. Now, drones are also used to deliver blood. Can you imagine that? In countries where the transport system is not very robust, sometimes um, using cars, Using, using trains or using any kind of transport is not the most efficient way to do so. So we have now figured out how to use drone to deliver blood to 35% of Rwanda national transfusion uh, supply. Okay. 
Now, one more thing that you can use as your example is the use of renewable energy. Now, renewable energy sources like solar photovoltaics, remember uh, when, you're talk, when you want to talk about solar energy, it's better to talk about a specific kind of solar energy because there are many types of solar energy you can talk about. So I tend to use solar photovoltaics. Note the spelling, how to spell photovoltaics, okay, and remember it. Now, in Germany, uh, after the Fukushima disaster, the government decided that, hey, you know what, I don't want to use nuclear anymore. So they started shifting to, nuclear, uh, shifting to solar power. And in 2016, on one particular day, because of the sun, because of the wind that was present on the day, all the electric supply was actually met with renewable energy. So uh, in the next couple of years, because oil prices are so high right now, we can see this uh, trajectory going on probably until like maybe more and more countries are going to start relying more and more on solar energy and uh, wind power. Okay. All right. Now, let's talk about carbon sequestration. Now, Sequestration is spelled this way. Again, do note the spelling. Many of you may not have seen this word before. What does it mean? Now, carbon sequestration is a technology that captures carbon that is usually from, say, power plant, and then put it back where it came from. Carbon comes from fossil fuel. Fossil fuel comes from under the ground most of the time. But how do we get this, prevent this carbon dioxide from being released into the atmosphere? We can actually pump it back under the ground, and the ground has a natural ability to absorb carbon dioxide back by, um, it's just a natural process. So when the carbon is pumped back into the ground, it will be stored under the ground permanently, and we can burn as much fossil fuel as we want without worrying about, uh, worrying about global warming. Okay, next one. Judges in America, they have been grappling with this problem, right? They don't know how, they don't know who, to release on, uh, on bail or to uh, grant parole. So they've come up with a system, an AI system, to assess who are likely to reoffend, who are likely to be integrated back into society without much problem. Now, this AI system has proven to be a lot more precise, a lot more accurate than a human judge in determining who are likely to reoffend. That's why the word recidivism comes from, this word right here, recidivism. Uh, but this system, yes, even though it's quite accurate, it is very controversial because uh, the system itself takes into account a lot of factors like you know, a person's race, their backgrounds, and it can introduce bias into you know, uh, who should be released on bail, and it can interfere with the justice system. So it's good and bad, you can use this in an evaluative paragraph. Hey, so just a summary, technology solves a lot of problems that we are facing today. I think this, uh, we've covered a lot, a lot of different technologies you can use. Here's a summary for you. You can, go, you can come back to this slide. Now, let's move on to the next one. Okay, the bad things about technology. I need to speed up a little bit, I guess. Okay, technology is not, uh, is not all beds and roses. Uh, it's being abused on a regular basis. Let's talk about how technology is being abused. One of the most common ways is uh, by hackers. Digital technology has been abused by a lot of hackers. In Singapore itself, if you are writing an AQ, you can use this as an example. SingHealth experienced a cyber attack in 2018 and a lot of data was stolen, including the data of our Prime Minister. So this data was then leaked. We don't know who has this data. Um, so uh, when used in the wrong hands, right, it can, have, uh, it can pose national, sec national security risks to us. Now the next thing is ransomware. I'm going to skip the middle part. Ransomware. In 2017, this ransomware called WannaCry, it hit 200,000, over 200,000 computers globally. It cost $4 billion. And even hospitals like the NHS was affected. A lot of patients were in need of medical care, but the computers were down. Now it was found that this ransomware was created by North Korea, was used by North Korea. Okay? We don't really know this yet. But that's what, uh, what people are saying. Hey. hey, if you want to talk about inequality, uh, like gender inequality, you can use this example. In Saudi Arabia, there are some applications that can allow the men to track their wives to know where they are. Now, it's, it's, it goes one way, only the men can track the women. So if you want to talk about gender equality, you can use this abuse um, as an example. 
Okay, military weapons, we talk about some defensive military technologies, but what about offensive military technologies that we can talk about? Uh, there are some technologies that are a bit more controversial. The first one is chemical weapon. Chemical weapon has the ability to kill people indiscriminately. So unlike a gun, you can point at a person and shoot. A chemical weapon cannot do that. Because once it's released, it doesn't matter the targets are you know, men, women, children, elderly, civilians. It does not discriminate. That's why it's very controversial. It was used in the Syrian um, crisis in 2018. Now, another weapon that's very controversial is cluster munition. Cluster munition, uh, you can think of it as some sort of landmine. Once it's released, right, it leaves behind a lot of landmines that can explode. Now, it can endanger the lives of civilians, so cluster munitions is actually banned in a lot of countries, but it was recently used by the Russians in the Russian-Ukrainian war. Okay, so just a summary. I'm going to move on to the next part. Now, technology can come with a lot of risks and unintended consequences. When we design certain technology, we sometimes don't think about how it can impact us. But what are some of these risks that are involved? Hey, think about self-driving cars, right? Uh, we might think you know, they're great, they're safer, but they're not always that safe. There have been accidents involving Tesla where the drivers die because the car was on self-driving mode. So it has happened multiple times. You can go and check out more on how self-driving cars can lead to accidents. Hey, another issue uh, about AI is the creation of deepfake. Recently, I watched a video of a lady, uh, a lady model, and the entire video looked just like an advertisement, but little did I know that the video was actually, the lady was not real. It was created with AI. That means that person does not exist. This is what we call deepfake. We can use AI to create a person artificially. We can even make them, to re, uh, make them resemble uh, maybe certain public figures. So that's why deepfake is a very huge issue. Um, people no longer can distinguish between what's real and what's fake. When the videos you're watching, like me right here, what if this is all AI? How can you tell what's real and what's fake? Hey, now, synthetic media. Now, Facebook took down a lot of accounts during the Ukrainian and uh, the Ukrainian-Russian crisis because the Russian network was actually perpetuating a lot of fake news. Now, this fake news was created using AI. They no longer hire people to type out fake news or create videos or pictures that are fabricated. They simply had to rely on AI to create this, um, uh, this fake information. Now, it's created using this thing called generative adversarial networks. So if you want to add, you, if you want to use more specific examples, you can quote this GAN uh, in your example. All right. If you are a student in China, I think you have to worry about, you know, um, not just your behavior in class, but your thought processes in class. Because in China, a particular school came up with a headband that can measure the brain wave and it can determine whether a student is paying attention or not. So if you are not paying attention, okay, I wouldn't know, but a teacher in China probably can tell if you are wearing a headband like this. Now, the problem with using this technology is this. It can lead to a lot of stress. I mean, just imagine putting on a headband that can figure out what you are thinking. That can lead to a lot of stress. Um, fortunately, I haven't seen this being deployed at the massive scale yet, but no, who, know, who knows what's going to happen in the next couple of years. Now, Hydraulic fracturing. Traditionally, if we want to extract oil, right, we have to drill a hole into the ground, into a reservoir where there's a lot of oil, and then we extract the oil from this reservoir. But over the years, as more and more oil reserves are being depleted, human beings are finding ways to extract oil from less conventional sources, perhaps from rocks itself, meaning there's no oil reservoir. I'm just drilling through rocks and trying to get oil or organic materials from rocks. This is done through what we call excuse me, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Hydraulic fracturing involves pumping water at high pressure to fracture rocks in the surroundings. Now, this fracturing will release oil into the environment, and then we will extract this oil from the environment itself. But the problem with hydraulic fracturing is this. It can lead to earthquake. So in um, states like Oklahoma, Texas, in the US, right, because of hydraulic fracturing, the incidence of earthquakes have increased tremendously. So um, you can also use this to talk about how uh, technologies like this is leading to increased global warming. Oops, I think the, the formatting is a bit screwed up, but it doesn't matter, just listen to me. Renewable energies 
hold a lot of promise to you know, saving the environment. But what if I tell you renewable energy, uh, some of these sources of renewable energy can also pose a risk on the environment, especially on the wildlife and on conservation issues. Now think about the spinning wind turbines, right? Okay. It's like a giant fan. What if a bird flies through it? That's exactly what happens. A lot of birds in the US have been killed, about 140 to 300,000 birds each year in the US alone have been killed by spinning turbine blades, right? They're very deadly to wildlife. Not only that, um, if you have a solar farm that uses concentrated uh, solar energy, you can think of mirrors pointing towards a particular source, that kind of solar farms. Now, that, that concentrated um, solar ray is actually very, very hot. So if you put your finger through it, okay, your finger will be gone, it will be incinerated. That's what happens to birds and insects that fly through these areas. They're being killed by the heat. So renewable energy itself can carry a lot of risks and unintended consequences. Okay, so here's a summary. I'm going to leave it to you to read it. Let's move on. Okay, technology enables exploitation. What is exploitation? Exploitation is when a group of people take advantage of another group of people, typically the rich taking advantage of the poor or corporations taking advantage of their consumers. So what are some ways of uh, exploitation? First one, uh, I'm just going to talk about hepatitis C. Hep C, you heard of Hep A, Hep B. Hep C is a disease that has limited cure. If you get Hep C, there are not many drugs that you can take. One of the companies that has these drugs is called Sovaldi. It costs patients $84,000 just for one course of medication. So um, the, the, the person, the, the company behind Sovaldi uh, is under a lot of um, a lot of criticism for what we call price gouging, okay? Price gouging, G-O-U-G-I-N-G. -G. Okay, next up, yeah. Vaccine inequality. When um, companies come up with vaccines, or I believe it was like maybe early last year, a lot of countries were fighting for vaccines, right? In Singapore, I think we only got vaccinated starting uh, April last year, just one year ago. Now, uh, as time progresses, the richer countries manage to stock up a lot of vaccines. They have enough vaccines, so much so that a lot of these vaccines will go to waste. On the other hand, we have countries like countries in Africa, for example, Nigeria, where they don't have enough vaccines. So this leads to what we call vaccine inequality. Uh, it's uh, one of the reasons why Omicron virus came about as well, because Omicron virus um, it affected South Africa. At that point in time, a lot of the countries had vaccines, but a country like South Africa didn't have enough vaccines for its people. That's why the virus was able to mutate and spread across the entire country and then spread all over the world. Right. Now, uh, exploitation can also come in the form of you know, billionaires trying to exploit people like you and me. I'm sure you recognize this person. I'm sure you heard the news. Elon Musk is planning to buy Twitter. He's in the process of, buying, of this like, writing right now. He is trying to buy up Twitter. And there are concerns that people like him, multi-billionaires, who already have a lot of power financially, politically, now they will have even more power because they have access to our data, because Twitter has a lot of our data, and some of it is private. Now, he's promising that he's not going to abuse the data, but who knows, when he buys over the company, um, and when he has a lot of shares, you know, he can decide what to do with our data. So that's a concern that we have. Technology can exploit, um, can result in exploitation. Now, next up, <coughs> okay, we have some examples for you. I promise this is the last slide from me. Uh, we have some examples for those of you who want to write AQ on Singapore, right? Uh, some of my favorite will be the second one, DBS Bank. DBS Bank is actually using a predictive algorithm to decide which employees are likely to leave the company using AI. Oh, that's, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't know whether employees will be happy if they know that they are being assessed using AI. Um, other things that you might want to take note of is that since 2020, all P4 to P6 students are required to learn coding. Uh, it's not part of their curriculum, but it's part of uh, what they have to learn you know, outside the curriculum. Okay. So that is all yeah, for what I have to share on technology. Right now, I'm going to pass the mic back to Mr. Chia. And he's going to share with you, uh, he has some questions for you. So, yeah, thank you, KP. So now is the time for him to take a drink. And we're going to move back 
to the Mentimeter as well for you guys to answer an important question. In the next segment, we're going to cover about science. But a key thing to think about here, do you think there's a difference between science and technology? Or are they overlapping? Do they mean the same thing to you? Again, please join us at menti.com. The code is 41095790. We'll your responses and we'll see how it goes. While waiting, of course, I was saying in the chat as well, we'll be giving you guys some access to free content later on. So do stay with us all the way as we try to unravel the mysteries of science in a short while. So, so far, the first response says that actually they're the same thing. We'll see how it goes in a while. Let's wait for the rest. And someone is saying BJC is good, I think. <laughs> Anything else that you guys have to say? Please tell us below what you think. Is there a difference between science and technology? If I angle it properly for you, when you look at this in your exam questions, if the question purely says technology does this, do you then assume that it's the same thing as science? Or vice versa, if it's about science itself, do you then say technology is part of that in the first place? So I see some of you saying that tech now comes from science. It's a branch of science. And advancements here yeah, can discover more theories in science. The long answer here saying that science explores new knowledge methodically through observation and experimentation. This sounds quite familiar to me because my students will know this. And technology is the application of scientific knowledge for different purposes. But nonetheless, the claim here or the belief here is that it's still very similar. So a lot of you guys are saying that technology is tied to science or is the application of science. And there's an interesting point here about how maybe technology is more tangible and science is more intangible. I'll wait a while more for a few more responses first. It's knowledge, application, okay. Someone did point out that science has experimentation. So is this saying that technology doesn't have experimentation? I'll wait a while more. And I'll pass the time back to KP in a while. Let's wait for maybe a couple more answers to see anybody else. Is anything to add in here? Again, it's a good time to then test your definitions. Don't forget, in your essays, you have to actually bring in the definition of a key term and let us know what it means so your teacher or your marker can de tell or determine your scope of your essay as well. So, last answer I'll talk about, this says that it's a discovery of theories, whereas tech involves the application of these theories. That's interesting. KP, I'll pass the time back to you to look through whether you agree with what they say and we'll dissect what is the difference between science and technology now. Now, some of the interesting things I see here is science involves experimentation. That is absolutely correct, but that doesn't mean that technology doesn't involve experimentation. Yeah? Now, what is the difference between science and technology? I think the, the concern that uh, we have a lot is when the question asks about science and we start bringing in technology. That's a very common mistake that students make. What is the exact difference? Now, think of it this way. Science involves theories, scientific theories. So you think about Einstein, okay, does he come up with technology? Mm, maybe not so much. He's more involved with coming up with the theories that can lead to technology maybe further down the road. So scientific discoveries don't always lead to application. Think about the theory of maybe Darwinian's theory of evolution. Think about um, theory of relativity. Now we can't always apply such theories. So in a way, science is not something that you see um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Technology is something that you can see more because it's application-based. Now, I talked about six areas of technology, you know, military, environment, medical, agriculture, you know, yada, yada. But I would like to point out that medical technology tends to be um, a bit science and a bit technology. So if you want to learn uh, science and technology together, my tip for you is to learn anything that has to do with life science. You know, Think about agricultural technology on, like, say, genetic modification, or medical technology uh, on, say, vaccination. Now, these things can apply to both science and technology. Other than that, let's look at what are some of the scientific theories that we have. I'm going to talk about um, the good and bad things of science. Yeah? Okay. The first thing is, science is unreliable. Now, why do I say that science is unreliable? We're not saying that science is not truthful, we're just saying that science changes all the time. For example, now, let's see. Now, Einstein's theory of gravitational wave, now it was not 
proven until very recently, many, many years after Einstein died. Now, here's the thing, right? Einstein came up with a theory saying that gravity is a wave, it's not just a force. A lot of scientists say, how can that be? You know, that's, that's impossible. And to prove this okay, is very difficult. They have to build a multi-million dollar facility across the planet in order to detect any changes in gravitational wave. And there was, it was only proven in 2016 because there was an explosion somewhere, somewhere far out in the universe, and the wave travels across the universe, it reached Earth, and that's when we discovered that, hey, you know, Einstein was right long after he died. Now, next. Hey, oh, wait, I think this is a, a good thing about science. Uh, one of the first vaccines that we have, actually the first vaccine that we have was by Edward Jenner. He came up with a vaccine for smallpox. Because of that, smallpox is gone. You don't have smallpox anymore. Whatever pox you're having right now, right now there's a monkey pox going, like spreading around the world. Uh, we're not sure how that will turn out. Okay, whatever pox you have had in the past, that's chicken pox, that's not smallpox, all right? Uh, okay, the other vaccine that uh, is very promising is HPV vaccine. HPV stands for Human Papilloma Virus. And it's quite a mouthful. HPV is a disease that can lead to cervical, cervical cancer in women. But nowadays, because of HPV vaccines, we are, we are solving this problem of cervical, cervical, uh, cervical cancer. So it's very possible that we can eradicate HPV maybe in the future. Okay, okay I'm going to skip this part because it's not too relevant to our discussion today. Maybe we can go next, next. All right. Now, let's talk about medicine here. Okay. Uh, Marie Curie, you're going to know about her. Marie Curie is the scientist who has won two Nobel Prize, one in chemistry, one in physics. If you're studying gender, you got to remember Marie Curie. Now, what is her contribution in science? She, does, she discovered radioactivity, and she applied it in x-ray. She, she used x-ray machines to treat wounded soldiers in World War I. So that's one of the the positive uh, application of uh, X-ray and uh, her scientific discovery. Okay, maybe we can move on to the next one. Okay. I'm going to skip a few parts because uh, I think we have better things to share later on. Uh, so I'll skip this part because you can read it yourself. Yeah? It's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Okay, next. Okay, scientific methods. Okay, this is what I mean by um, the scientific methods always change, right? Uh, now, some examples include <clears throat> right here, for 80 years, we thought Pluto was a planet. And then the scientists in NASA studied Pluto a little, a little bit more. They studied the planet system. They realized, hey, wait a minute, Pluto is not a planet. So for a person who wants certainty, right, science is definitely not the area they want to look at because science changes all the time. Now, right now, even right now, scientists are debating whether to reclassify Pluto as a planet, whether to turn it from a non-planet back to a planet. Okay. Now, other examples are, okay, in the past, we thought, they say in the 19th century, we thought that an atom was the smallest indivisible unit that we have. But then in the 20th century, we found that the atom was not the smallest because we have a, an even smaller thing called the electron. Nowadays, we know that even an electron is not the smallest unit because we have things called quarks which are even smaller than electrons. So who knows what we're going to discover in the 22nd century and so on. Okay? We may find even smaller and smaller subparticles. Hey, <clears throat> um, okay, now this is about the black hole. For many, many years, scientists believed that the black hole could only be of a certain size because any bigger than that, a black hole could not exist. But in 2019, one person in China he discovered a black hole that was so much bigger than all the black holes that we've seen. Okay, it's called LB1. And that actually overthrows the theories, the mathemat mathematical models that we have always had about black holes. Yeah. Hey. Now, <coughs> very, very important to pay attention to this slide over here. Science is never, because science is ultimately a human creation, right? We discover scientific theories. We come up with theories itself. Now, it can therefore be manip manipulated by people who have the intention to do so. Now, uh, just take this as an example, right? Okay. A survey by public library found that 2% of scientists have intentionally manipulated data. Why would they do that? For a scientist to achieve any level of success, they have to publish papers. And to publish papers, they have to have, they have, to have results. And to have results, sometimes, 
you know, they have to manipulate some kind of data. If not, they will just be publishing non-results. Right? If they have a particular theory that they couldn't prove, then all their hard work would have gone to waste. So some of them have you know, resorted to changing the results. Now, uh, another example that I can bring in is ivermectin. You guys might have heard of ivermectin. It's a medicine for animals. But recently, there's been a lot of talk about how ivermectin can be used to solve, to cure COVID-19. Now, is that true? There were some scientific studies that showed that ivermectin could cure COVID, but then a lot of these studies were flawed and they show signs of fraud. Um, what are some of these signs of fraud? Okay. Uh, some scientists, some studies actually took the samples and they rearranged the samples such that the people, the patients who were more likely to die from the disease were put into the control group. The patients who were healthier were given ivermectin. Now, of course, the end results would be that people who took ivermectin will be healthier, will survive the disease. And uh, that actually leads to some skewed results. Other than that, there were some studies who included phantom participants, meaning these patients weren't even there in the first place. So that is a way of manipulating data. And there was also the anti-vax movement uh, many years back when Andrew Wakefield, this person, who found the correlations between vaccine and autism. Now, was this correlation justified? Uh, if you learn more, a little bit more about what Andrew Wakefield was doing, he was actually sponsored by a group of parents who were in a, in a legal case who were suing vaccine companies. So they sponsored him to publish this research. So there was a conflict of interest. Therefore, the paper was revoked by the scientific community. But then the falsehood that Andrew Wakefield perpetuated still continue on many years down the road. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, so here's a summary. I'm going to move on to the next part okay. on scientific risks. Now, science is not always safe. It carries some risks, especially when it comes to experimentation. Uh, there, is, there was a disaster in 1960 called the thalidomide disaster. Pregnant women were given this drug to help them sleep. But a lot of those who took these drugs, right, they gave birth to babies who had deformities like this, like what you see over here. Uh, eventually, they found out that these drugs were not safe. Now, the reason, okay, rather, uh, what happened was they didn't test these drugs enough. So, after the thalidomide disaster, uh, all drugs that have to be that are sold nowadays have to be have to go through very rigorous clinical trials, like the vaccines that you have taken. Okay, now um, the others, I believe you can read about it. Okay, I would like to cover a little bit about scientific. Scientific um, ethics. Yeah. Oh, sorry, exploitation. Now, science can be exploited by companies, by people with power for profit, right? For instance, think about Coca Cola. Coca Cola was actually publishing research that shows that diet does not does not now listen, diet does not lead to obesity. Meaning, if you eat a lot, that's fine, okay? But um, the uh, but if you don't exercise, then you're more likely to be obese. We now know that that is not true, yet Coca-Cola is funding studies that show otherwise. Why? Because they want people to continue buying their drinks, their sugary drinks. Now, ExxonMobil was also involved in a series of misinformation campaign. Uh, it published a lot of fake signs showing things that are pretty controversial, like the fact that climate change is not real, global warming is not real, that human beings did not contribute to global warming, that fossil fuel was not responsible for global warming. All these studies, right, actually just serve to uh, just serve the agenda because they are a fossil fuel company. So science can be exploited for profit, especially science that is usually sponsored by companies. So do take note of this. Hey, next up, I'm gonna pass the mic to Shan Hao. Now, Shan Hao, a very good teacher, he has taught in MOE school and he has a double major in political science and Southeast Asian studies. Now, what's more interesting is this, uh, Shan Hao can speak five languages. <laughs> okay, I'm very impressed with him. He can speak Thai, Indonesian, and Vietnamese. I'm learning Vietnamese right now. Maybe someday he can teach me. So I'm going to pass the mic to Shan Hao where he will share with you about scientific ethics. Do pay attention here because he will be sharing with you on how to evaluate, uh, uh, on how to use certain theories to elevate your points. So, Shan Hao. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. 
Great. All right, thank you, KP. That was a very flattering uh, introduction. I, yeah, maybe one of you can uh, go for Vietnamese classes together. All right. Uh, Great, so let's move on really quickly to ethics and how scientific research, scientific technology can really raise ethical conundrums or problems relating to ethical concerns with morality and the way the human condition or humanity perceives these progress um, in, in, you know, in general, right? So let's move on to a few case studies. The following case studies that I'll bring you through are actually very um, famous, very classical debates in, in, in human history, especially, during, especially in uh, Western uh, medical sciences and just the, the field of science alone. So let's begin with the first one the Tuskegee experiment. Now, this was a huge um, you know, controversy in American history. What really happened was uh, African-American communities were studied for the effects of syphilis. Now, syphilis is a very um, contagious disease. Uh, and the problem with the experiment was that these black American men were actually tested on without their, their consent. Now, this was something that was forced. It wasn't voluntary. And the, you know, the sound of that alone just raises a lot of alarms because this is not ethical, this is not humane, but the controversy actually was even more serious because the scientists purposefully deprived the test subjects of a cure, which meant these African Americans were tested and over the period of, I think, 40 years, uh, they were deprived, they were refused um, the cure, even though these scientists knew that, the, that there was a cure for that. And today, uh, the practice is widely condemned by the scientific community and remains some form of, a, I would say, a traumatic experience for the African-American community in America and of course as um, an important milestone or important reminder that ethics should remain an important concern in, in medicine. All right, let's move on to another similar case study. Uh, this is none other than the Willowbrook, the Willowbrook State School Experiment. Now, let me go through what really happened. Uh, in the 1950s, there was a pedi pediatrician. His name was Sal Krugman, a really bright guy, but less so in terms of his ethical approaches. Um, Right, so he was asked to resolve the rampant hepatitis problem in Willowbrook State School for children. So this was a school in, on Staten Island in New York. Um, uh, and the state school was a school or educational institution for children with intellectual disabilities. All right, so at a point in time, 90% of the school children were infected. Right, this was a really high number and also presented a huge opportunity for a very opportunistic um, doctor like Krugman himself to want to step in and want to find out what were the rampant causes and what were the structural causes or at least, um, you know, understand how hepatitis worked or how hepatitis was um, diagnosed and then finding the cure for these things, right? Um, so what happened was he actually proceeded to infect these students with hepatitis um, strains. I'm really sorry, there's a little um, error there. Uh, but what really, what really resulted, right, what the outcome was that Krugman uh, experiment helped him to discover two different stain strains of hepatitis A and B. So these strains are uh, familiar to most of um, the medical community and outside of the medical community as well. And 15 years later, he developed a prototype hepatitis B vaccine, all right? Now, the controversy, of course, continues to be a problem for Krugman, but at some point, at, you know, at, on his end, what he tends to justify his actions was that he agrees that the ends do not justify the means, but he doesn't, mean, he doesn't think that these um, ethical concerns or ethical uh, conundrums apply to his own work because the children at the school were constantly exposed to the risk of acquiring hepatitis, which means he thinks that his work actually produced good results, right? Especially because if he didn't step in, he, he, he thought that these children would actually contract the disease anyway. So this was an important, again, episode in, in the history of, of medical technology and research. So let's look at something else, um, a little bit diverging from, from, the, from medical technology. This is the Bikini Atoll experiment. So this was a series of 67 nuclear explosive tests um, in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean, which include the devastating detonation of a hydrogen bomb. Now, for most of you, you understand, you, you, uh, most of us would know that um, nuclear testing has side effects because there are radiation leaks, and radiation, of course, is not something that the body um, you know, takes, takes, takes very well. And consequently, local tribes in the Pacific Ocean, there are numerous tribes actually, um, suffered from radiation diseases. And until today, many of these test sites, which include Bikini Atoll, is still uninhabitable today. Right? So these are ethical concerns. Now, um, the other example that I'll go through today, which is something that most of you would uh, find a little bit closer to the heart because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, would be the Princeton University's crazy proposal, or just, just a proposal for herd immunity for India. So you guys might be familiar with how herd immunity works. It's a medical uh, proposition that 
if you were to introduce a certain, vac uh, certain virus into a community or a certain uh, society, over time, the society would develop a form of immunity that would ultimately be beneficial and provide some kind of immunity against the, the, the strain or the contagion. All right. So in 2020, researchers from the Princeton University proposed the same idea for India, and they believed that the strategy might be successful because there was a disproportionately young population that would face less risk of hospitalization and death. Of course, these things were not very well received by the international community and of course by Indonesian policymakers, oh, sorry, Indian policymakers, and of course it wasn't um, executed, it wasn't uh, carried out, and it was rejected. Now, so these four experiments or these four cases uh, in our history show that scientific progress raises ethical questions and conundrum, right? Uh, apart from the ethical question, the problem with science is that science is really costly and experiments and research can be very expensive and sometimes it can take a toll on people involved, stakeholders like governments or private sector actors as well. Right? Uh, and this is especially, especially so for those, um, in some ways, science deniers or naysayers who hasn't really seen the value of science. Well, uh, this is what it looks like in, in these three case studies. The first one is the idea, um, sorry, is the experiment or the project in Switzerland known as the Large Hadron Collider. And these aims to study um, the, the particle physics, right, quantum physics basically. And this is one of the most expensive equipment and costs, uh, and, and it costs up to $1 billion a year to run, which is actually half of Central Africa's Republic GDP. In other words, not everyone's gonna be able to afford these programs. Only some of the richest countries and states in the world can afford to funnel some of the state funding to these programs, right? Uh, the other example is the idea of space exploration. So NASA's 2020 Mars rover, of course, intended to study Mars's, Mars's ancient geography, uh, no, geography, so history, geology, and you know, the further the human search for life outside of Earth actually cost 2.46 billion. So imagine what happens if uh, a, com a country in debt, right, or just not being able to support these kind of projects um, would think of, right? And of course, uh, in terms of um, the increase in budget, we're also seeing a trajectory of more money being put into space exploration, especially by states that can afford it. The example here is Trump, increasing NASA's budget by 12%. Right? The final picture here is an example of how um, just for a single picture alone, to take a picture at a black hole at the center of the M87 galaxy, this is one of the many galaxies that scientists have found out, $15 million was spent. Imagine spending that to take a single photo. This is absurd for some states who really cannot afford it or don't see priority in scientific research. Right, so in sum, the point here is science is really expensive and the three examples should be enough to show you why some states have no interest or have no you know, stake or do not prioritize the idea of scientific research and technological advancement, All right? Um, let me move on. And the point is, if states fail to prop up these programs, if states fail to direct money to these programs, sometimes science needs the market too. When I say market, what I mean is science, scientific research, scientific technological advancement sometimes needs the market hand and private sectors need to come in and prop up the entire process or the entire research uh, programs. And one very good example you guys may be very familiar with from the Twitter acquisition weeks ago is Elon Musk SpaceX. Now in May 2020, NASA astronauts launched the commercially built SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft to the International Space Station, the ISS for short, uh, from American soil, which right, was actually um, strongly affiliated or at least demonstrated the fact that sometimes state owners, st uh, stakeholders from the state and the government need to work hand in hand with private sector uh, actors to ensure a better outcome. And this demonstrates that sometimes science really needs the market and public sector hands alone cannot ensure that scientific progress is maintained or achieved. Now, uh, so these are some points that we can talk about. Science and tech can solve problems, science and tech cannot solve problems, science and tech can create new conundrums uh, on science being merely a tool. These are the points that we've talked about earlier. Uh, and these, again, are running parallels and running debates that most of you might have, have uh, you know, thought about before. All right, so we're gonna talk about scientific determinism. All right, so the idea of determinism here is a theory that social progress follows an inevitable cause driven by technological innovation, which means tech determines the way society functions and how soci social progressions or social conditions unfold. Uh, and thus, technology is believed to be a key mover in history and society, and therefore, 
by extension, humanity, because it determines our cultural values, social structures, and histories. Some of you who might be familiar with uh, very apocalyptic or dystopian uh, science fiction uh, will actually relate to the idea of technological determinism. Wally, -E, for example, definitely is an example of technological determinism. Now, but in reality, what really happens is that science and tech is merely a tool. Right? If determinism was that technology determines the way we live our lives in the world, a more optimistic stance, or at least a more um, balanced stance, would be that we own technology and we decide the way technology is utilized in society. Now, it is generally accepted that technology does not determine, but operates and is operated upon a complex social field. This is by Murphy and Potts, academics, uh, written in 2003. And the idea that technological constructivism really entails uh, this very simple proposition that human actions determine and shape science and technology. Right? It is not technology that determines how we live our lives, but human actions have agency in determining the use of science alone. Right? And in this, in this field, what we need to consider is the inherent motivations um, and human factors like economics, governance, politics, right? even culture and social and, and social religious traditions. Right? And how, uh, on the other hand, you also have limitations of human beings human error, for example, and the lack of ethical foresight uh, that limits these things. So on one hand, there are push factors of how, uh, sorry, enabling factors of how human, eco human, human economics, uh, governance can push forward science, can push forward technology. But on the other hand, we also have disabling factors like limitations and the lack of an uh, ethical foresight that can determine the way we think about technology. All right. Uh, I have come to the end of my part, and this is also effectively the end of our sharing today. Let me just... Um, bring back. Thank Maybe. you. Right. Thank you, Shan Hao. Thank you so much. <clears throat> right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, we are not done sharing yet uh, because we have a little bit more to talk about when it comes to evaluating your science and tech questions. Now, we've shared a lot about examples that you can use, right? But examples are not enough. You know, the best they can get you is maybe a B. But no, knowing how to use these examples in your argument is a lot more important. Those of you who are aiming for an A, right, you want to pay extra close attention to what we're about to share. Now, let's talk a little bit more about how to uh, evaluate our points. Maybe, um, Mr. Chia, you, uh, maybe Mr. Chia can share with us a little bit more about evaluation for science and tech questions. Yeah, hi. I'm on. My sound is working. No, no it's not. Now it's working. All right. Hi guys, I'm back. So actually, I just want to talk a bit more about evaluation as well. The first thing, of course, in your GP paper is that you want to make sure that you actually answer more than just yes or no in your answers. So one way we talk about this is that if you're asking a question about how science and tech or even parts of science and tech can solve something, is to consider nuancing certain keywords in the question. In this case, here will be the word solve. You realize that whenever you look at a question that says something like that, the word solve itself can mean a number of things in your points. You can talk about how it's about being able to solve on a surface, a superficial kind of thing, or you can talk about how you can solve quite a number of things as well, but maybe it doesn't address the root cause. Alternatively, you can consider how instead of solving things, in the process of attempting to do that, we see how it creates new problems. We look at that when we saw a lot of the ethical issues that are created, especially when we see medical research, when we look at certain more controversial stuff, be it self-driving cars, be it looking at cloning or other things there as well. So the other thing I want to talk about as well is the fourth part here where we talk about the two segment and how actually there is determinism versus constructivism. Let me angle that a little bit as well because one important thing that you see in many science and tech questions is that the questions tend to ask you about the impact of science or technology or science and technology. Now, the impact question is one out of six or seven different question keywords that may come out in your exams. And how the impact questions look like is basically they'll ask you, how does Y affect X? So how does science and tech affect something else? Maybe our lives or human progress or solving global problems. These kind of questions, you realize that the question itself, the statement in the question, it does have a bit of a problem with it in the sense that it is all based on this idea of technological determinism. And of course, this is a reductionist theory. You can always bring it out and reflect that. Actually, the statement, in looking at how science and technology is trying to affect or is affecting a part of our lives, is actually a flawed viewpoint to consider it from determinism only. Instead, in reality, what really happens is that science and technology itself, be it either science or technology, is always affected by how humans use it. In fact, we are always, on a daily basis, constructing what we like to see in 
terms of how our world innovates with science and technology. So when we see things that are happening, sometimes it's through the sheer human will that we see such things occurring or new inventions being created as well. So then what you want to do here is, after going beyond saying yes, no, you can critique the statement in the question and show me how actually in reality, technology is actually constructed by us and by society in general. Yeah, so it's kind of like when people say guns don't kill people, people yeah. kill people. Yeah. yeah, so do the guns really kill people? If those of you believe that the guns actually are responsible for deaths, right? So you are subscribing to which theory again? There'll be determinism. Determinism, yeah. Right. So yeah. if you believe that guns don't kill people, but people do kill people, and that will be constructivism, right? Yeah. yeah, so I guess that's a very good way. Thank you, uh, thank you for sharing, Mr. Chia. That's a very good way to uh, evaluate your examples. And I guess you can use it for all sorts of, pretty much a lot Actually, of... A, a lot of questions. The main thing you want to make sure you avoid doing is to hijack the question. So make sure you answer the questions first and then use this aspect to tie in a deeper evaluation. And of course, if you want to add the gun energy, sorry, you can always talk about how science or technology is not a silver bullet to our world's problems. In essence, is actually dependent on how thing will be. If any of you are keen, again, we have shared just now our Facebook page and YouTube page as well. You are on the YouTube page right now, so do follow us as well and our Instagram page. Besides that, uh, the other thing that will happen is that for those who are based in Singapore, we are giving free GP workshops on the 1st and 2nd of June. If you are keen, do WhatsApp us. Just scan this QR code or you can save a number, take a picture. Uh, this workshops are non-obligatory. So for the J1s, it's a two-hour workshop. We will talk about a bit more about the things that we briefly shared just now. For the J2s, it will be a three-hour workshop where we'll go through a lot more to make sure you guys are ready for your exams as well. Okay, and let's move on to the next part before I go to Q&A. Uh, there is one last segment. I think the fonts have not become very kind to us when we change the size of the screen, I'm sorry. So again, if you would like to join us, there's also this free lecture that I'm going to give out here. So you can scan this to actually access a free Science and Tech Part 1 lecture where we go through the general impact of Science and Tech. That will angle for us the different parts that we talked about just now, how we can solve problems, can't solve problems, create new problems, as well as how it is a tool. So you see a breakdown of all the things that we've covered in greater detail, so you're able to just apply this in your essays or to understand this. This apparently has been quite helpful for many students as well. I even had one student tell me that actually he got lucky, he only studied just this lecture and then he got an A for GP. So it is worth, worth taking your time to look at it as well. One lecture to get A for GP. Yes, but again, <laughs> it's a risk if you only study wow. one topic. Yeah? That's why we have asked you guys for your feedback to look at other topics like arts, media, environment, politics, for example. Yeah. One last thing I'll just share uh, is that we are having June programs as well. We have upgraded this package. So we are giving out uh, seven lessons and four lectures at a normal price that you will pay for as well for G2. For G1s, you have six lessons and two lectures as well. Uh, lectures, of course, based on the different content that we will share with you if you're keen. And we have group discounts as well if you're interested. Okay, so you can take a picture of this screen if you want to. I'm going to move on and we'll go back to the Q&A section as well because that part, uh, KP and I will need to well, see what you guys ask, and then we will try our best to answer what we can. Mr. Chow, would you like sport. to share these lectures? Are they going to be online or uh, oh, physical? Yes. So actually, the lectures will be online for some of them, and the tutorials, however, will be either online or physical. So give us a ring if you're unsure about various things. You can answer your questions there as well. If you have other questions here, you can always ask on the this uh, Mandy chat now. So please go on and continue to ask us questions on Mandy.com. And now we just answer Q and A that you have. Uh, ideally, first thing you can ask us will be about the, the lecture Science first. Science and tech. Science and tech first. And then after that, we can go ahead to look at other questions that you have, like the skills questions here. So we'll see. We'll wait a while first, and then we'll start answering some questions, maybe in about 30 seconds to a minute. Again, feel free to ask us things you want to ask about GP, but ideally, start off with <coughs> Science and tech first. And then we can move in a more general direction. Yeah, correct. It makes more sense for us. It's not like we'll go everywhere and that could affect some of the viewers here as well. Okay, so far we have still this one question. We'll How do we avoid example-driven points? Yeah. If not, we could answer this. Let's give it 30 seconds. So we have a few questions now. Oh, I see. Okay. And it's all skills questions, so no sign of questions yet. 
Okay, maybe we'll answer the questions here first. Since I guess they are more worried about different skills. So I will give my input and you can share with me. So the first question here is about how do we avoid example-driven points? Now, this is actually a very common thing that we see students doing at the start when they join in to do GP, especially at J1. And I think one thing is important is that your arguments must have a factor or a reason that is not tied to a case study. Many times when you write your point, you gotta make sure that your point is a general macro point that is able to encompass wide ranging examples. When I say wide ranging examples, it should be covering different aspects of our world, not just one case study or one thing. I'll give you a simple example. Many students are to write points based on COVID or COVID vaccines, full stop. And your entire argument is then skewed across based on just this topic, rather than looking at how perhaps science and technology can cause problems or solve problems per se. KB? Now, if you're looking at science and tech questions, I'm just going to use it because we are talking about science and tech. Yeah. Let's say you are writing a paragraph and on your mind, you're thinking about military technology. Now, avoid having the word military in your topic sentence. You can zoom into military in your example, but the topic sentence and the explanation itself, it has to be a bit more all-encompassing. That means you can't just have um, you can't just talk about military, that particular topic sentence should be able to accommodate maybe military technology and medical technology at the same time. So if that, that's a test that I can, give it to, I can give to you, if the topic sentence can accommodate two different areas of technology, then very likely it will not be example driven. I think a good gauge as well is that you find that your point is driven to one aspect of society, like a social, political, the kind of part, then it becomes a problem as well. Okay, we have a number of questions now. Let's move on ahead. I'll see you again if there's any science and tech questions. And so far, it's not yes, science and tech questions. Yes, the PowerPoint questions. slides will be shared. Yeah, we will share those PowerPoint slides with you guys yeah. as well. Okay, let's look at this. Let's talk about politics here. So this question says, in what way can science and tech regard, or be re regarding tech politics, I guess, recently, other than the Ukraine-Russian war or conflict? I think in this case, uh, this question is quite poignant since I think it was 2020. Is it the question about science and tech being a democracy? Or benefited, yeah, to democracy in the first place. Mm. So uh, let me answer first again. Uh, when you look at this, uh, politics itself, you do not always just look at conflict. There are many other aspects that happen here. A very simple example of tech will be how in our last elections, there were a number of Singaporeans who were voting overseas. You found that actually they could vote electronically or through other means instead of physically being there. You can also look at how politics especially, you can see how technology is used sometimes to watch over us. You can look at Trace together. You can look at the CCTV cameras that you're staring at near you as well. In many ways, politics can be very broad. So science and tech does cover a lot of things within politics as well. Okay, uh, if I can just add on, and Mr. Cha shared a lot about uh, different technologies you can use. Uh, one of the areas that you might want to look into is media, because media and politics are very closely tied. So you look at social media, that is technology, right? And social media has a lot of influence on politics. If you look at the 2016, 2020 elections in the US, in Singapore, a lot of it is, a lot of the, uh, uh, the electoral fights are fought on the internet. So, um, so think about, you know, fake news, falsehood, think about, um, you remember Hillary Clinton 2016? Uh, it was, uh, it, there was a rumor spreading around saying that she was running a child sex ring on social media. And that could very well be a way of the supporters of Trump who were trying to discredit Hillary Clinton. So it relates to politics because it relates to media. So uh, for this question, I think um, one of the best things that you want to attend is a media crash course. Maybe we should cover that in the next one. Yeah, maybe we should. Uh, beyond that, one last thing I'll say, don't forget the Chinese social credit system. You'll see that entirely the country is run using people's biometric details, using AI to track whether you are worthy of something or not, or whether you should be accepted into something or not. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Again, I'll look through those which are Content first, then we see how it goes. Anything else besides that? Ah, nice, okay. Okay, this is an interesting question. Should we bring in religion as an evaluation for science and technology? Uh, it is possible, but you gotta consider how you want to use religion in the first place. I would say that actually for 
religions, uh, or in the case of science attack and religion, you will find that most likely you could apply it to talk about the ethical boundaries that science and technology might contravene. And these ethical boundaries are things that, especially if you believe in religion, things that we cannot cross. So the idea of trying to play God and things like that will become a problem because when you look at science and tech, there are things that could be created or researched upon, like cloning or things like euthanasia, that could be controversial with regards to religion as well. So you could use that as an evaluation in your essays. Now, for this particular question on religion, right, uh, I find it a bit odd. Uh, maybe you have been exposed to certain questions that ask you to compare between science and religion, as in the case in one of the years of A-levels, right, we have a question uh, between science and religion. Uh, human action should be based on scientific facts rather than religious faith. So, um, science and religion uh, can occur in the same question. Whether or not it is useful as an evaluation, I would say it's not that common to see that. Um, if you do see that, it is more likely to be in science rather than tech. Uh, now, of course, uh, speaking of religion, right, some of you might also ask, now, what about science and art? There is also another, another uh, debate that yep. we have when we talk about science. Uh, we didn't go into details for this particular crash course because that's, those, those questions are pretty deep. But um, I'm sure you know, there, we can release some resources on the tension between science and religion and science and art. Actually, for those of my students who are watching, uh, I think I briefly mentioned some of you guys that we are covering science versus religion in one of the four lectures you'll get in June. So look out for that as well. Yep. yep. In June, you'll learn about it. Whoever next... asked this question. <laughs> okay, we have quite a number <laughs> of questions now. Uh, yeah, so we just talked about this science versus arts question. It is usually tied to education, I would guess. Yeah, correct. Uh, besides that, don't forget, uh, you're looking at the nature of what science and arts are like in the first place. Yeah. Yep. So I'll mark this as well. Uh, how will we notify? So actually, we will do the same thing. This time around, actually, most of you guys, wait up, sorry, sorry, I'm sure you get too far ahead to clear the rest first. Mm. Uh, what does digital age mean? So this is a relevant thing, I think. It's about a question about how, is it true that digital age leaves no one behind? Mm. And what does digital age mean? So actually, in this case, uh, I think it can be acknowledged as either a given context slash explicit assumption question. Like you must tell me that in digital age, this means that. If not, you can consider that as a changing context question. Uh, but in terms of digital age, I guess you will mean about digitization. Things yes. being moved towards with technology, being online, being ported away from being physical in nature. So that to me would be what digital age stands for. Uh, again, when you define key terms, Try to make a broad definition so you can set a scope for your essay easier. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So pretty. Brief. Yeah. You've covered pretty much everything. Yeah, Thank sorry. you. Yeah. I'll pass <laughs> yeah. you the question. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Anything else for <coughs> science and tech? That's great. You can cover it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm still recovering from my COVID okay, symptoms. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay. We've covered this a little I'm bit. I'm more than happy to let Mr. Chan answer everything. <laughs> sure. Uh, for the arts and science question, by the way, uh, it's important to look at the value of art as well versus the value of science. It sounds like I'm trying to sell, but I'm not trying to sell, but uh, for our students, again, in June, you receive arts and culture lecture, and you will see this as well. We debate about the practicality of things as well. Uh, my hint to you is we may want to consider things like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and why certain people will argue that science is actually more worthwhile, more practical, perhaps. Mm. But there's value in both sides as well. Of course, in GP, never yes, no answer all the time. Okay, moving on first. Again, I'm going to track through any other questions about science and tech. Okay, oh, I think we... How about the previous one? That is really, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. How has technology affected human interaction? Do you recommend we do it? Restrictive okay. question. This is not a restrictive question. Yeah, it's a very broad yeah. question. Yeah, it's a pretty broad question. I would say uh, this one, you, how has technology affected human interaction? It's not... Uh, an argumentative question either, the way it is asked. Yeah. So if they ask, has technology negatively impacted human interaction, maybe it's a little bit more, um, more argumentative. But nonetheless, let's assume that you know, uh, you're given this question. Do you recommend we do it? It's actually pretty easy <laughs> to tackle this. Question. Yeah, it's quite a doable question. So you need to define human interaction uh, yeah. in, in what way. You know? do, you, do we mean like face-to-face -face interaction or do we just mean like between two human beings or a group of people. So it's better, like what Mr. Cha said earlier, to define it a bit more broadly, and then you can tackle it uh, in, in different ways. So one of the ways that you can talk about is 
you know, during COVID, definitely you can bring in this example, right? During COVID, we have seen technology actually brought a lot of value to us because otherwise this lecture would not be possible, okay? You have to come to class to see us and the class has a limited size, right? So technology, in a way, it has actually improved human interaction um, and it has also enabled like large scale hum human interaction, especially in times when um, things get a bit tricky, when human to human physical interactions are discouraged because of spread of diseases. I think besides that, uh, one way whenever you want to brainstorm about a word that could be brought is just look at the different pillars of society, consider the different aspects that you can think about for human interaction, connect to social lives, connect to people, uh, tied to maybe perhaps politics, tied to the economy and other aspects of media as well. Then you will see that actually it's quite a broad question with a number of points that you can answer as yeah. well. Mr. Chow, will you bring in a psychological perspective over here? I could consider that. I think the main thing here is to think about the word e affected as well, whether you want to say uh, it's always good or bad. Maybe you want to consider how actually the reality is that it does both and then you look into the complexity of how technology could be well used by different people as a tool for various reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Actually, yeah, psychology, there, there was uh, an example as well. If you look at the, the lecture notes that we we're giving out as well, about how psychologists are being replaced by AI tools and actually they found it easier because people tend to be shy when they want to share about their problems but, but when they spoke to an AI psychologist it was fine, it was better. Yeah. AI right. counsellor. Yeah, AI counsellor, correct. Okay, uh, there's quite a lot of questions, maybe we need to choose a few now. Uh, I would like to track my likes but not that many likes here. Some of you guys are asking paper two questions as well. So maybe we need to pick and choose. Okay, let's look at this, perhaps. How can you answer science and tech questions tied to other topics, crime, politics, arts? If we don't have enough content knowledge, or if you don't have enough content knowledge, then don't answer it. I think that's a very easy um, question. But then, um, of course, uh, a lot of us, we have this issue when we think of, oh, wait, no, science and wait, technology and politics, I don't have any example. But like I said earlier, you, know, you can always think about the other domains that are a bit related. So you can talk about you know, um, human rights, uh, you can talk about media, you can talk about the social, social credit system. So it's important to brainstorm everything you've learned about science and tech and then see which are the ones that you can use. Um, this is a, an important question, I think, because uh, increasingly, Cambridge is running out of questions to ask. So they are starting to bring in different topics to relate it to, you know, especially technology, such a broad topic, right? So when you are doing a revision, uh, we will be giving out, as I think in some of our content packages that we, we give out, you will encounter questions like this. So do pay attention to these, the examples that we bring up in these questions. I can't cover this uh, within the scope of this lecture, but do uh, take note of the essay outlines that you'll be getting, yeah? So again, it will be a uh, link in the description below. Yeah, so feel free to join uh, our Telegram chat as well. There's the first class Telegram chat, as the Illum Telegram chat, where we do actually share a number of examples across different topics so that we can help you guys out as well. Yes. Yep. Okay, uh, let me see if there's anything else for Science Attack. If not, let's clear maybe a couple of questions. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, this is a question that is really tied to science versus religion though. So uh, I will cover this a little bit because one of the quotes that I will talk about in Science and Tech, Science versus Religion. The main idea here is that when you look at science without religion, it's lame, it's saying that science cannot move forward without religion. The idea here is that if you look at the longer quote from Einstein, by the way, this is just a shorter version, uh, to him, religion is the one that has the moral compass to guide us in the first place. But then he argues that religion, on the other hand, uh, without science is blind. He's saying that without science in the first place, religion cannot see the truth in the first place. So again, when you look at this question, you are angling that comparison between science versus religion. We don't want to spend too much time on that because that is a very niche topic. Again, uh, if you look at the number of questions that has appeared for science versus religion, it tends to be a few schools that tend to ask that in their prelim papers. In national exams, it has yet to appear yet for in the last five, six years or so. Perhaps you could spot it and think that it will appear. Uh, I would say maybe, but there's a probably a lower chance. But if you want to use these uh, arguments here to tie towards the ethical parts of science as we covered earlier on. Yeah, anyone add here? Yeah, I think uh, ethics is something that you have to bring in. It's inevitable. Uh, it is uh, very important for you to know how to argue about ethics, though it's not easy. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, before you attempt this question, make sure you have read some essays on ethics, some model essays, and make sure you have learned it. Yeah, don't just jump into it without 
having tried it because it can be a trap, these sort of questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm gonna just look through again, we cleared this already. So maybe we'll cover two <coughs> skills questions. KP, you would like to choose? Okay. Any one that you want to do? Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, let's look at this question. How to think of a good rebuttal and is it necessary to use a bombasting word in arguments? Uh, there are two questions here, it's a, it's a double barrel. Yeah. How to think of good rebuttal. Uh, personally, I have seven ways to come up with rebuttal techniques. You can think about uh, things like problem solutions, you can think about stakeholders, think about context. Uh, one of the, uh, the things that I like to use in exams, especially in AQ, is to look at the changing trend, right? Let's say you have, um, you no, know, is uh, for example, is Solving environmental crisis, right? Is it realistic? You know, I can talk about some uh, factors, some drivers of environmental protection, and I can say, however, the trend is also changing. You know, we are seeing some drivers in the opposite direction where environment is being degraded. So um, there are in total uh, seven rebuttal techniques that we can use. Um, I will make sure to take note of this. Uh, besides those that I mentioned, uh, I will probably make a video or uh, give some information on how to write rebuttal. I'm sure there are a lot more rebuttal techniques. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of rebuttal techniques. I think the, yeah. the, the core concept that you got to remember is that your rebuttal has to show me that the counter argument is not correct, either logically, so there's a fallacy, or either in terms of scope, and that will be how it's myopic. So I do recommend using contrasting lenses, in my case, things like how is theory versus reality, long run, short run, minority, majority, as basic samples, but the idea here is that you have to reject the counter argument. If your rebuttal just says they say this, but I think this way, then it's, it's not a rebuttal. Yeah, it's not helpful. It's just at all. another, just another yeah. one of your arguments. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's one of the pitfalls of rebuttal. Mm. Yeah. Ultimately, your rebuttal, if you only have one counter argument or rebuttal in an essay, or be just two, is actually the the pinnacle of your essay. You want to showcase that look, I have good argumentation, so I wrote a rebuttal here. So use it well. Don't just like state it for fun mm. and. That's my viewpoint, their viewpoint. Instead, reject the CA. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the bombastic words in arguments, uh, uh, I would say it is not really necessary to always use the bombastic yeah. words to kind of uh, reject it, unless the term is at, like really fitting in that case, then I'll go for a bombastic word to reject that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, for my students, you will know that it has a vocabulary that we always talk about. You can use that as well. I think they're saying bombastic words in arguments in general. Yeah, not, not yeah. can't, can't, yeah. can't uh, <laughs> I mean, Whoever asked this question, you seem to have, uh, uh, you seem to not like vocabulary very much. <laughs> Maybe. But, <laughs> Calling not, it bombast, not, yeah. yeah. But there are some, there's some value in there's adding very, yes, some good yes, words yes. to use. Yeah, they don't necessarily have to be uh, words that you almost never seen before. Mm. Yeah, but just using app words will do, or phrases even. Correct. Mm. It's good to have them, but if they stand, start to confuse your audience or yourself, ah, then that's not good. <laughs> yeah, then it's not a good thing. Okay, one last question, perhaps. Uh, let's go down. The first one has the most likes, you can consider that. There are those so it's, who it's a range according to popularity. Uh, we do have model essays, we do have uh, the latest crash course, we will share with you guys the PowerPoint slides as well. Uh, quite a number of things here. How about we answer the first one then? It's a heritage. So it's prelim, how can we help to yeah. preserve heritage today? How far can, oh, how far can tech Yes. How to preserve heritage right. today? Uh, I think in the context of Singapore, if you go to, uh, if you've been to museum these days, you can see museums themselves. They are also, they are also um, evolved. They are using a lot more technology. They make it more interactive. They make it. Uh, they use a lot more visual multimedia content to help make heritage a little bit more relevant, relatable to you. So, for example, the use of videos is one good thing, and m many museums they started using videos as well. So does it help preserve uh, heritage? I think yes, it does. Uh, there are also certain examples you can bring in on how technology is um, helping to put heritage in a more favorable light. So certain buildings may, may come across as, you know, they, 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 they're like a sore thumb, you know. Uh, Singapore is so modern, yet there are certain buildings that are so old because they've been preserved for historical reasons. Now, uh, technology is helping to bring out the other side of these buildings. If you remember, I think every year there's a light show in, um, uh, is, it, is it Singapore River? Along Singapore River, where they will screen projector images. They will project images and videos onto the external, the exterior of museums or exterior of certain uh, heritage buildings. So these buildings start to come alive. 
Oh, so again, uh, a very, I would say, quite an art question. Uh, yes. If you were to attempt this, uh, those are some of the, <coughs> yeah. the examples that you can bring in. It's more of an arts and culture heritage question. <coughs> it's actually looking at, I guess, te how technology can assist that. <coughs> Besides the examples that Kibi has mentioned, I think the other thing to look out for, if you want to, is look at the new forms of technology like AR or VR. I was just sharing before we started this lecture, KP, that I play some VR games, like the boxing games, to try to get some fitness done. But in terms of Google Arts and Culture, if you guys have searched that before, it is actually something you can access with AR as well. So you can actually view different museum pieces around the world as if it's in front of you at your own home if you have a device that allows you to do that. And most of our phones can do that as well. And of course, there are many other ways that technology can help. Uh, in the end, end of the day, what you want to think about is what heritage stands for to you. And again, every question, there is that term that you want to nuance and offer me the broad definition. And then from there, like what KP was saying, you can talk about buildings, you can talk about different aspects of heritage as well. Would you consider intangible things like um, maybe food, language as definitely, heritage? Definitely, yes. So yeah, in that case, you, know, you guys can think about YouTube videos where you learn yeah. how to speak in a certain minority language, mm. how to uh, cook a certain traditional food. All these technologies are helping to preserve heritage almost permanently, I would say. Yep. Okay. I think... I think, yep. That should That's be good. it for today then. Thank you guys for your questions. Uh, we enjoy these questions and we yeah. really enjoy you guys here. Um, <clears throat> we hope to bring more and better crash courses, better workshops to you guys. And uh, June is coming up. I'm sure all of you, you are preparing for your examination, which is why we're trying to have this as early as possible this year. If, you, if your exam happens to be after June and you would like to prepare for it, I would highly recommend you join us uh, in June for the workshops. Yeah, please give us a WhatsApp as well, and we will follow up with those of you guys who have, who have contacted us previously with regards to the actual uh, YouTube live video today. And if anything else, just drop us a text, we will answer your questions as well. Okay, thank you very okay. much, guys. Okay. Have a good evening, guys. Have Bye. a good evening. Bye-bye.